Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And we are in Polyglota 2021. Now we have a talk by Madeleine Kelly from Canada. She will talk about um, how to use your native language and uh, let me let me see here the name. The importance of mastering your first language. So Madeleine is a runner and also a journalist, and she will speak about uh, using English as her first language and how it helped her in her life. Okay, please. Hi everyone, I'm Madeline Kelly. I am Canadian and I am a journalist and I run the 800 meter on the track. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, Juliana, could you allow me to share my screen? Now we oh, can. Perf perfect, thank you. Um, do you know where to click yeah i do but it says i would have to change my system preferences oh one second system preferences okay anyway that's fine we don't really need it um but yeah, today I will be talking about the importance of mastering your first language. Um, I am an Anglophone. I speak some pretty rudimentary French because most Canadians speak some pretty rudimentary French, but that is really my, my one and only real language is English. But uh, English has in the end been very important to me and facilitated a lot of things in my life because I took time to become a very proficient English speaker. So I was born and raised in a small town of about 10,000 people, and there was really only English and some French spoken there, but I was not really encouraged to learn another language, but also I wasn't really encouraged to become particularly great at my native tongue either. At the high school I went to, there was a big emphasis on math and science-based courses, and there was not that much money or time put into the arts. Um, but thankfully I had parents who really encouraged me to read and practice writing. I've always been a big lover of books. I would spend like days in the summertime just you know finishing a full novel when I was a kid and thankfully I had parents who saw value in that so even though I had lots of high school teachers sort of confused about why I would want to go to university and study English that was uh, what I decided to do and so I moved to the city of Toronto, which is Canada's largest city. So I went from a town of 10,000 people to a uh, city of about 4 million people, which was five hours away because I wanted to experience more cultures, but I also just wanted, I wanted a complete change. I wanted to you know, really see what a city had to offer. And so I went to university there and studied English. Um, at university, I was still a little confused myself as to what I would do with this English degree. Um, it was certainly not a traditional path. I would say in Canada, if you want a job out of an undergraduate degree, you would be looking at doing um, engineering or a science-based program. However, uh, I found actually that I could use my, my language proficiency to my advantage because I learned that lots of my friends who were in you know, math and science-based programs, friends of mine who did coding, things like that, were nearly illiterate. Like these were very, very smart people, but because they worked so much with tech, they didn't really have to be uh, proficient in English. Um, 
And also there were just so many students at the university I went to who were from all over the world and weren't particularly strong at English. There was actually everyone who comes to this university has to do an English competency test because the university is so multicultural. Um, only about 50% of the student body is Canadian. So I realized that I had a skill or was developing a skill that lots of my fellow classmates didn't have. I understood you know, grammar better than most people. I became the editor of my friend group anytime people had to write a paper. And I realized that, you know, sort of something that a lot of people considered a soft skill, so to speak, actually could work to my advantage in the workplace once I was done my degree. So while I was at university, on top of my studies, I was also a track runner. And that is uh, something that I had always loved and kind of just continued to slowly improve at to the point that when I was finished my undergrad degree, I decided that I would like to continue to run track and field. Um, however, there was not, there isn't a great sponsor, sponsorship situation in Canada. So if you want to continue in university, you're funded by the university, but if you want to continue beyond university, unless you're exceptionally good, you're kind of on your own. So I needed to get a job because uh, running was not going to pay the bills. And I applied to a job at a running magazine. And thankfully I was accepted for the position. I didn't realize at the time, but I was wildly underqualified. I uh, felt like my English undergraduate degree, like four years studying English had prepared me and on top of my knowledge of the sport, but when I arrived at that job, I learned just how much I didn't know. Um, so in Canada, with journalism, there is a certain standard of um, essentially a certain format you have to follow. It's basic things like spaces after periods, you know, how you annotate a birthday, how you annotate a province or country, um, indentation how we use quotations, uh, you know, parentheses, square brackets, all of these things have a very, very specific formula that's called the Canadian press style. And I didn't know any of this. So I had to buy textbooks and read about this. And I had a really great editor who was very patient with me. And while I had the basic language skills, I didn't, I didn't understand the nuance of um, written journalism and how much goes into it. And the fact that these little small differences in your language comprehension make a massive difference over the course of an article for a reader. So that took me a good few years to get a handle on and really improved my language proficiency in a way that I never would have had had I not been given this job. Um, Beyond the basics of grammar, I also came to realize kind of much like interpretation and translation, when you are writing a story about someone, um, the onus is on you to convey their message properly. So they give you, you know, you do an interview, they give you your quotes, they express to you what they would like you to express to the world. And then it's your job to craft that story in a way that adequately delivers their message. And without very strong language abilities in the language that you're writing in, it would be impossible to accurately convey this person's message. So I, I also understood the importance of language because in written editorial, you don't have any um, you don't have any body language cues, you don't have any intonation cues, all you have are words. So if you're not using the right word, or if you are sort of misconstruing what they're trying to say, then you can very easily have a frustrated subject because they'll read what you wrote about them. And then you'll get an email or a message saying, that's not what I was trying to say. Like you took my words out of context. You didn't accurately represent me. So I came to understand how difficult it was, but crucial it was to be accurate. So as I was working at this journalism job, my running improved 
and it improved to the point that in 2019, I won our national championship. So following winning our national championship, um, it was a very interesting thing that happened because not only did more doors open for me running wise, but more doors also opened for me writing wise. So I got offered jobs at bigger Canadian publications, um, national publications that were not just running based, they were general interest jobs. So I was writing to, you know, like millions of people as opposed to tens of thousands. And that job would have never come along without one, me improving in my first journalism job and becoming more proficient at my language and at my craft, but also it wouldn't have happened had my running not gotten to that level. So it was very interesting to see the two coexist and sort of help push the other forward. So as I became a better writer and a better runner, I was able to ask to move from writing on the web. So I was writing primarily for the website, which are shorter stories that are about three to 500 words to writing longer features. So more like 2,500, 3,000 words. And with that came a much more flexible work schedule, which allowed me to train better. And with a more flexible, flexible work schedule and more time to train, I ended up qualifying for the Olympics this past summer. So that was, that was very cool, um, obviously from a running perspective and an athletic perspective, but it also opened even more doors from a writing perspective. And I was able to continue to write about and report on my experience from inside the village while also competing there. So I sort of was this funny, I actually got in trouble. In the end, I got in trouble from the Canadian Olympic Committee because I didn't know that athletes are not allowed to act as journalists, um, but they discovered that um, I was actually a journalist as opposed to someone just like in the village getting intel. That was actually what like paid my bills outside of running. So I had I was involved in a very long email chain. There was a cease and desist, um, but it, it all worked out in the end. But uh, all of those opportunities sort of helped build on each other. And really all of it started with a love for the English language and a love for reading and writing. And I could have never imagined, you know, just as a kid who liked the library, that these things would all, you know, lead to both my athletic and professional career. Um, so finally, I, following the Olympics, have a new job still in writing, but now I am working in the communications department for uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, which is one of Canada's largest financial institutions. And so now I'm doing things like writing tweets, writing Instagram posts, writing emails, press releases. So certainly less creative, but a job with a little more stability for sure. And uh, that job would not have come to me without my previous writing experience and it also would not have come to me without my olympic experience so that's where i'm at now and really all of that is due to um, cultivating a love of english and continuing to pursue uh, excellence in my field of study uh, now medic can i just interrupt here to say something juliana yeah, yeah. I know that Maddie uh, prepared a uh, presentation and uh, uh, some slides. So maybe as I am talking, maybe she can try to figure out uh, because I, I think it would be interesting to see what. Yeah, maybe I she have. Could, she could send it to me, and I could share my screen. Maybe that's. Wait. Yeah. Okay. One second. Okay. So while she's trying to to figure that out, I will just ask my question. <laughs> If it's okay, so, uh, unless the, the someone else wants to jump in. I would like to, to, to show some slides now. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay, so yeah, send I, the file I just to want to fill the void. Share my screen, but please ask a question, Teresa. Oh, do you want me to ask a question? I just saw that someone is talking, so we're not here, just we all mute. <laughs> okay, so... Um, 
Are you my question for Maddie. Is... What's up, Maddie? Um, yeah, I'm just seeing if I can do it on my own. One second. Here, yeah, I'll just I'll I'll, I'll send it to you. Send it on WhatsApp, okay? Okay. I don't know if I should ask my question if I'm going to distract her because she's trying to to send this whole document, whole slides to you. I don't know. So what's your question, Teresa? Maybe you could ask it. Sure, well, maybe before I ask my question, I'll just say that to whoever doesn't know, um, I do have a relation with uh, Maddie. She dates my son. They've known each other for four years now. Um, they met when, when my son went to live in Toronto for a couple of years to go to teacher's college. And um, that was before even Maddie started writing for the magazine, or maybe she was already writing for the magazine, for the Canadian running magazine, I'm not sure. But they both ended up working at the same shoe store selling running shoes, which was also relate, a relation to running because my son used to be a runner as well. So that's how they met. And um, they live together now in about an hour from here. So I see them often. And I'm just so proud of Maddie, of what she has accomplished in her short life. She's only 25 years old and she's just so mature and she's just been a joy um, in our lives. She makes all of us happy. Thank you. Did you manage to send? Yeah, I sent it. Yes, okay. I have a file. So yeah. I'm going to share my screen and uh, okay. Maddie okay. can tell me when she wants me to go to the next slide, okay? Okay. Yeah, we can. I mean, I've I sort of like went through all the. There's really just a, a video that I wanted to show. You have okay, it on the screen now. Okay. So yeah, go next. And then keep going. Yeah, you can. You can keep going. That's just a picture of Toronto. Okay. That's where I went to university. This is this little, um, the picture at the bottom is of one of the first ever stories I wrote that ended up on the cover of the magazine. And those two women, on the cover, they're sisters, and they were my training partners at university, and they are now some of the best 1500 meter runners in the world. So that was a very cool story that I got to write. Very full circle. And Maddie also mentioned that both of them went to the Olympics. Yeah, why we, the three of us were at the Olympics together. So next slide. Um, this is just a little excerpt of a story that I wrote about um, a man who lives in Toronto now, but he's actually from Peru. And so he came here as an infant with his mother as refugees. And he went through a series of very difficult things. He was had a heroin addiction. He um, is living with AIDS. He came out as gay. And running has been a big part of his journey and a big part of his self-acceptance. So that is an example of like being given very serious subject material and wanting to make sure that you do a person's story justice. Um, and that I wanted to make sure I expressed it adequately because one, he's being very vulnerable, but two, this is serious stuff that, you know, some people in his life didn't know about his previous addiction and AIDS and things like that. So um, yeah, with serious, with serious subject matter comes great responsibility to accurately tell someone else's story. Um, so you can go next slide. And I believe the next one is a video. Oh, is the video coming up there, Juliana? There we go. So this is 
Um, probably just play like the first five minutes of this, but this is in 2019, a video of me winning the national championship. And this is ultimately uh, one of the races that helped me qualify for the Olympics. This, okay, me, this is really the first time I thought I could qualify. Let me see if I, if I shared my screen with audio, I don't know. Uh, yeah, now yes. So I'm gonna play it, right? Yeah, just, I think at about five minutes, you can stop it. We don't, the whole thing's a little long. Women's 800 meter final. This is one of the most highly anticipated finals of the entire weekend. The depth in this event right now is fantastic. Andrea Prop in lane one, competing unattached out of Saskatchewan. In lane two from the Saskatoon Track and Field Club, Julianne Labac. In lane three from CA Uni Laval, Lawrence Cote. In lane four from the Coastal Track Club, Lindsay Butterworth. She has the World Championship standard. And in lane five, Melissa Bishop. Nuriagu, Nike, and the Ottawa Lions. And listen to this reception for Ms. Bishop Nuriagu, the 2015 World Silver Medalist. Jenna Westaway in lane six from Speed River Track and Field. And in Lane seven from Sherbrooke, Métis Bouchard. And in lane eight from the University of Toronto Track Club, Madeline Kelly. Well, Adam, there's so much to say about this race and about these women, of course. Melissa Bishop Riagu multiple time national champion in this event, multiple time national record holder in this event. All eyes will be on her. And had it been any other year, I think most of us would have said she'd been a shoe in for the win. That still may be the case, coming off of the birth of her daughter a little bit over a year ago. Ran a new personal best in the 1500 meter earlier this season. Ran very strong in the preliminaries yesterday to win and come through to this final. But of course, Lindsay Butterworth with the fastest time in the nation this year. The World Championship standard. You could see some excitement out of this race tonight. Surely will. Ross Cote in the pink on the inside. She ran a personal best of 202 to make it through to this final. Of course, there will be pressure as well from Jenna Westaway, the shorter figure in the black kid on the outside who broke Melissa Bishop's indoor 800 meter record this year, although she also <laughs> She'll have some work to do if she wants to rejoin the leaders. And you know, Adam, there is just so much tension in this field. All of these women knowing that they are meant to be there. This really could be anyone's race. Bouchard with the edge right now. Last year's bronze medalist. Bishop Nuriagu right on her shoulder. Maddie Kelly, the small figure in the black kid on the inside. Happy to sit in that fourth place position. Strong move by Westaway now. The indoor 800 and 1,000 meter Canadian record holder as Riagu starts to get a little bit of distance here. She is wanting to prove to this field, yes, I am still here. Fish is back. Let's make this honest. She is a four-time national champion in the 800 meters. Still looking to get that world championship qualifying standard. Right now she's being hunted down by Lindsay Butterworth as well as Ross Cote. The gap remains, but into the final 100 meters here, they come. Butterworth tracking Bishop, making up the distance on her and now swinging to her shoulder. Ross Cote moving well as well. Bishop, can she hold on to this lead? These three, the fatigue sending in. Cote making a pass now. Cote around Butterworth. Maddie Kelly moving up well. Maddie Kelly on the inside. And, and it will be 
Maddie Kelly for the win! <laughs> what a finish by Maddie Kelly, just edging out the four-time national champion, Bishop Nuriagu. 20237 for Kelly. And Kelly cannot believe it. She has found a personal best every time she stepped on the track this year. <laughs> she just can't believe what just happened. Anyway, you can you can cut it there. I'm I'm sorry it's so choppy. I don't know why it's doing that because it's just a screen recording. But um anyway, that that race really that race really changed my life. Um that that was a that was a big day and ultimately one of the races that would get me to the Olympics. I just didn't know it yet. Yes, Mary, and also it's important to say that all the three girls on top, they all three, they all three of you went to the Olympics, right? Yeah. So after yeah. that you... race, what changed for you? So after that race, I um, received government funding for the first time and you know money isn't everything but but money helps for sure and then I also um, got more writing opportunities after that race as well um, so I was able to change my work schedule so that I was doing more independent work as opposed to with a team so I could do more on the evenings and weekends so I could be training during the daytime um, so yeah, that, that race changed kind of everything about my life. Okay. So let's see if people have questions for Maddie, either on zoom or here. Well, I have a question. Hi. Hi. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Well, uh, once I saw a video from, from Professor Aguilis, and he said that when you exercise languages while you walk, that kind of uh, help your entire body to work better, including your brain. And uh, my question is related to that. Uh, how much you think your exercise and your uh, way of being so competitive and full of energy can help you uh, toward your language um, path. Thank you. Um, I, so again, I am, I am not a uh, multilingual person. However, I do, I do think I have a lot of my best thoughts for my writing um, when I'm running. Uh, and so I don't know the exact science behind it, but I would certainly say if I am having a hard time with something at work, or I'm not sure how to express myself, or I'm not sure exactly what I want to say in a story, uh, I'll usually go for a run. And by the time I've come back like an hour or so later, I've worked it out. Um, there is certainly something about, you know, running or walking or whatever form of exercise you prefer that is kind of meditative and I think gets your brain and the state of flow that I think allows you to, to think very clearly. But again, I'm, I'm not a scientist. So that's just sort of my take. So take it for what it's worth. <laughs> okay, and Maddie, you talked about writing uh, stories on people's lives. And mm -hmm. have you ever written something that someone didn't like and they complained with you about it? Yeah, all the time. Um, it is it is very it is very hard to please everyone. Actually, impossible. Um, and sometimes there are cases where I've written on things that are a little controversial. You know, um, questions about funding, questions about sort of like ethics in sport. And yeah, usually there's a group of people who don't like what I've written um, or feel that they've been um, sort of slighted. Now, there's a difference between misrepresentation and someone just kind of like grumpy about how something was written. And you never want to misrepresent someone. You always want to clearly articulate someone's, you know, message and intentions. But in every piece of writing, there's a little bit of you, right? So my take usually gets worked in there somehow. So there have been times when I've accurately represented someone, but I've also stated that I disagree with them. And that's usually the most the most difficult position. But you 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 never want to misrepresent, but you you can have a difference of opinion. 
So anyone, any questions? Okay, Teresa, Me, please. Yes. Okay, so Mary, you have said that um, even though you grew up in Pembroke, which is a small city, um in the northern part of uh, ontario and it's really even though it's really close to quebec just on the other side of the river is the province of quebec um but um you um essentially did not develop uh, your unfortunately your french skills to the point of being considered considered fully bilingual you do understand a, a lot of french but you're not you don't consider yourself fully bilingual now my question is um if, if you do have kids one day, and I think you mentioned that you'd like to, would you like them to become bilingual, trilingual, whatever? And what can you do to make sure that happens? What kind of resources around you where you live uh, you could tap into so that, um, to ensure that your kids become bilingual? See, to me, um, becoming bilingual, trilingual, it's hard when we live in a big country like Canada, like in Brazil, it's way easier when you live in Europe, when the countries are so small, you travel a lot. To me, it, uh, it's a geographic thing to, even though people think, oh, in Canada, everybody's bilingual, but where we live, most are not. So Mary, so that's my question. What, what can you do to ensure that uh, if you said you'd like to have kids one day, if you do, uh, would you like them to become bilingual, trilingual, and what can you do about it? So there were, it was mostly English speaking where I grew up and there are parts of Quebec that are very French, primarily French. However, those parts are further east than where I lived, um, like six, seven hours further east. So when you grow up in a community that speaks one language, your schools really only offer one language. I mean, every school in Ontario or in Canada has to offer French. It has mandatory French in grade nine, but beyond that, it's optional. So I actually took extended French um, all through high school and French immersion in elementary school. So that's a half day in French. However, even if you're doing a half day in another language in school, if you go home, and your parents don't speak it to you, and if you're in your community and no one speaks it in your community, it's really challenging to actually absorb that language. So I would say I was on the path to being bilingual if I had um, continued in university to study French. I think I would have gotten there. Um, however, I didn't. But thankfully, Teresa and my boyfriend speak French and Portuguese, so it would be much easier to send kids to school in French immersion and in the bigger center we're living in now there's French immersion offered through all 12 years of school, whereas where I grew up it was only offered until um, grade eight. So there's French immersion there's actually completely French school here, and there wasn't where I grew up and then beyond that they could hear it at home. And I think that makes that makes a world of difference because it just, it wasn't in the community I was in. My parents didn't speak French, they only spoke one language. And so there, you know, there's only so much, so much that two hours a day can teach you. It's better than nothing, but I don't think it gets you all the way to being bilingual. Okay, uh, Maddie, you said that you work with English and also sports two different careers that you have in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. But what about a person that only, uh, only works with sports? Do you think that those people, if they can express their ideas better or they can speak better in English, they will be better seen by the sponsors or it only depends on the, the times they make on the track and it doesn't matter if they speak well or not? Um, that's an interesting question. I think speaking well helps, but there are a few, I mean, the unfortunate reality is if you are good looking, that also helps. And if you are good looking and willing to post a lot on Instagram, that helps even more. And it's strange to say that, but it's just completely true. A lot of sports dollars now go to influencers over necessarily those who are the best at their sport. Um, so you, it's actually not good enough anymore, unless you are like 
Usain Bolt or like, I don't know, an American NFL player um, or I guess, you know, some of the so- some of the male soccer players would also do f- like get get along fine just on their playing ability. But generally speaking, you can't just be a good athlete anymore. Unless you're truly the best in the world, you need to be a good athlete, but you also need another skill. And if one of those skills is posting on social media, great. That actually works these days. But that's not really my thing, so I needed a different skill. But um yeah, just just being being good at sports sports is no is no longer enough to make a living at it and uh people if you want to make questions in portuguese it's possible because we have interpreters into english uh, it, it, i have one more question and that's my last question in the moment mm-hmm. uh is it easier to earn a living with sports or with your other job as a journalist Oh, with, with my other job, it's for sure easier to earn a living. Sports in, sports in Canada are not really a priority. Um, not, not the way they are in America. America loves sports. And I think a lot of people think America and Canada are the same and we are very different in some ways. And that's one of them. Um, so yeah, as a Canadian, you certainly, I, I would be making more money if I wasn't running. Uh, I'll put it that way. Okay, that's very nice. So let's see if someone has more questions or not. I don't know. We have 33 people here. A lot of people are watching this talk. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have a, a question in Portuguese and then you have to select the English channel. Okay, Maddie? Okay. I think you have done that already. I don't know. Yeah, I'm in. Olá, sou eu de novo. <risos> é... Hi. Olá. Minha pergunta é sobre uh, como você falou da questão dos influencers. É, você já pensou em fazer alguma coisa muito louca, por exemplo, atravessar o Canadá correndo e gravar isso e jogar no Instagram? <risos> alguma coisa nesse sentido, porque isso ia gerar muita visibilidade também e como você é jornalista, eu acho que é legal. <risos> Obrigado. Se não, fez para Did you get the question? Yeah, it is I I just I don't love social media, honestly. If I if I was better at social media, I would make more of a living. That's the truth. Um I I don't love social media and I'm not particularly great at it. Um, I know it, it actually is a skill to be good at social media. I'm sure we all know that we all use it um, and I'm not great at it. So if, you know, if, if, if anyone has an idea for a social media stunt that, that could get me popular, I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing and open to hear those ideas, but um I don't think all of Canada is possible because that's like, like hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Um, it's, it's a massive country, but, uh, but like maybe the city I live in. <laughs> that's great. So people mentioned here, Forrest Gump. What do you think about that runner? Good, good movie. I'm a Tom Hanks fan. I think everyone should be a Tom Hanks fan. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how great of a, of a runner Tom Hanks actually is, but, but great movie. Yeah, I think so too. So any, any last thoughts on sports and languages from anyone? So we don't have more questions. Thank well, you very I just much. wanted to say, I just okay. want to say one thing, Juliana, just to um, emphasize what Mary said when she said um, she, the, get, the best ideas for her writing she gets when she's running. Right, Mary? You said, you said that. Mm-hmm. I totally re- agree with her because I run as well. And, uh, and that's the time I have to, to think, to, to, you know, to process. Uh, my, my idea is, uh, I'm not saying that every translator, every interpreter, everyone should become a runner, no, but 
I, I do find that I, if I'm stressed out and if I need to clear my mind, I need to move. And when I move my body, it doesn't have to be running, biking, swimming, walking, whatever. You end up doing a better job, either right? to write, translate, or whatever you're doing. So I totally believe in this combination of exercising your body and exercising your mind at the same time, not just one or the other. That's, I just want to find yeah, out. Yeah, and maybe a last comment that Maddie could say is about the career path that athletes have to change. Someday they have to find a new career, right? So mm -hmm. in your case, you found very early two careers. But uh, how is it for people who only do sports and then after they are 30 or 40 years old, they can have to find a new job? It's very, it's very difficult for a lot of people, actually. And I think it's something that's, that's being addressed finally, which is great. But it, it causes a real crisis, actually, for a lot of people because they've been very good at this one thing. And they've been told that in order to be very good at this one thing they need to have nothing else in their lives and then sport is over and they realize that they have nothing else in their lives and i i think that that's people are realizing that you need either to be in school or you need to have a job or you need to have at least like a hobby you're passionate about like you need to have something else that gives you experience and self-esteem so that when the sports are over you don't feel like your life is over i mean that's a little bleak but I think there are a few programs in Canada now that are starting to encourage athletes to look for part-time work while they're competing. But this has only been in the last few years. For a long time, you're actually discouraged from working while competing because people felt like that would detract from your performance. And uh, do most athletes, when they find a new career, do they remain working with sports somehow or do they work with something completely different? What? Um, it's, it's kind of 50-50. I think it, it depends. There are some people who when they're done with sports, they just feel like they're done with it. Like they don't want anything to do with elite competition anymore. They want to be removed. And there are other people who are still very much, you know, in love with the sports world or their sport that they did, and they want to continue to be involved. And so I really just think it depends on the person you are and the kind of experience you had, because I think it's also important to remember that not everyone leaves sport feeling like they had a good experience, right? So I think that hugely plays into whether or not you want to remain in the community. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah. Thank you for Thank having you for, me. For being here at Polyglot Art 2021. Okay. And Julian, <laughs> she can't wait to go to Brazil. That's her dream, right, Mary? <laughs> She'd love to go to Brazil. And you would like to run in Brazil? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> she keeps Don't telling Sylvester. the truth. Do you know that? They, Don't they, Sylvester, the marathon? I don't, I don't think she ever heard. It's a, it's, it's not a marathon. It's like, I think it's a 10K run. They do in Sao Paulo every year at the end of December. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's, a, it's very famous in Brazil. So maybe you're going to run that. Maybe we'll, we'll run that together one year. How's that? That sounds prizes. very fun. <laughs> you can win prizes. Oh, prizes are great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye.